welcome to Sabbath School this morning. There's just a few of us here. And hopefully some more will be joining us later. But uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and then we'll begin our lesson study. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Um, we thank you for the prayers of others. We thank you for the sweet by and by. And Lord, um, we thank you for your healing touch. We ask that you be with our group here this morning as we bring our worship to you uh, through the study of your word. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to accompany us as we um, discuss the different things that uh, uh, the lesson might be bringing out but also that we have gleaned over this week as we've studied our lessons as well. So Lord, uh, be with us now. Be with those who are still at home uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, or maybe other reasons. Uh, Lord, as we begin a slow rollout of, of, of coming back here this month of June as we add a sermon time, we pray that uh, our church family might find uh, um, where home is once again. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I've got the microphone up here, so that'll turn out a little better. I want to thank you for joining us today. We uh, have a lesson that is lesson number 10 in our quarter. Our quarter will end at the end of June. And so this is lesson number 10. The Bible is history. And I guess I have always thought of the Bible as history and or historical in its references. Um, and uh, I have found it to be accurate. Um, and uh, those controversial things over the years, um, the secular world has also found them to be accurate. And so some of the critique of scripture uh, in its um, um, validity when it comes to historical events um, they, want to, they want to mostly classify it as, as myth or legend or, or just nice moral stories, um, but not historical at all. But when we look at the Bible as history, um, there's things that um, would kind of unravel. You know, here a couple weeks ago, or the last couple weeks, we were talking about creation. So if you take away creation, there's things in Scripture that, that just unravel, and, and if there is no Creator God, then, then there's no God. And uh, so, same with the um, uh, historical uh, validity of, of Scripture. We need to make sure that, that if the Bible is founded on truth, then uh, that's, a, that's a positive thing, right? Yes. You know, um, so the lesson has a memory verse there that I will read. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Some people question the um, event of the Exodus. In fact, uh, many, many uh, archaeologists are struggling to to validate, if you please, the Exodus. But if the Bible is true, what else is true? The Exodus. The Exodus and that that whole event and where where the founding of the nation of Israel came from and and their their claim to the to the land there, all those different things. If it didn't happen then we can see that there's some people that would really like to rewrite um, history. Um, some people say that uh, David as king never existed because there's no 
historical archaeological evidence for that, but here in recent years they've actually found some things that talk about him. And so uh, if David was an actual person, and then um, there's other things in his life that we can, we can look to. Um, so the historical nature of Scripture is one characteristic that distinguishes it from uh, sacred books of other religions. Uh, it's, not, it's not just a, a, a nice story or whatever. There's actual history and archaeological evidence for. Um, it's fascinating to me. Um, uh, there's, there's folks in, the, uh, in one faith, the Latter-day Saints. Um, they have, uh, ever since Joseph Smith uh, propagated it, he talked about Jesus coming to America and preaching the gospel in America. And then they talked about, and, and if you've ever read the, has anybody here read the Book of Mormon? Uh, it's, it reads like a storybook. <laughs> but there's all these epic battles and all this, these giant cities and everything else. And of course, when they go to try to find these places, they can't find them and they don't have evidence for the battles they don't have evidence for anything else whereas the bible there's evidence that these battles took place and the, and the towns and the cities that they talk about they're actual places and um, and so it's it's interesting when you discuss with uh, somebody that has uh, um, uh, uh, the book of mormon as their foundation for their faith they are quite uh, uh, it, it kind of unsettles them when you talk about the historical facts that, the, that their book points out because there's no evidence for it. Mm -hmm. There's no archaeological evidence. And they say, well, we have the plates, but you can't see them. Mm -hmm. Nobody can look at them or whatever. So it's, it's interesting, but you know, and of course the Bible talks about the Ark of the Covenant, but it also talks about it being hidden away. So, uh, and why, is, why is that? Why is that? Yeah. That we don't have the Ark of the Covenant right now? That it's hidden. Well, it was hidden because of the Babylonians when they were going to come take over and they sacked the temple and took all the utensils and everything. Um, uh, Jeremiah asked that it be hidden in one of the thousands of caves somewhere in the area. And uh, some people think that it's actually underneath the hill of Golgotha in a cave down there. Uh, Ron Wyatt uh, has claimed to have um, observed it. Um, so the, this, the, it's a characteristic that distinguishes uh, our Bible from other, other sacred religious books. Um, the Bible assumes the existence of God. And if the Bible is untrue in its history, um, we would have reason to kind of question whether God was who he says he is, right? If he says, I'm the one that brought you out of the land of Egypt, and if that didn't happen, what God are we following? And so, some thoughts from, from you folks. What's, what's the importance of the Bible being uh, historically accurate? It's not a history book, but it's a book that contains history, right? So what are some of the reasons or rationale that history is a good thing? Because if we choose, we can learn from the mistakes of the past and hopefully not make the same mistakes. Although history proves that we don't tend to do that uh, at even, the same time. Yeah, even, even today, we know that we don't, we forget history. And it only takes a generation or two for people to forget. Um, here, there's very, very few folks that uh, survived World War II that fought over there. And they're, they're, we're losing them daily by huge numbers. And, and in just a few short years, there won't be anybody left that fought in that war. Um, when the Civil War was fought, 
of course, when those veterans started to, to pass away and die, uh, there were some lessons that were learned during that war that were forgotten. And, and, and so our history is, is bound to repeat itself if we forget it. So the Bible is the same way. It has lessons. Anybody else have something they want to add? So, otherwise, you get two sermons today, I guess. Well, I, I had a politician say this one time. He said, when you have two things involved in politics, it's either fact or it's truth. And if you don't have the facts or the truth, then you pound the table. <laughs> so, so the facts matter, right? <coughs> yes, they do. And so, and so the historical details in Scripture just kind of bolster and, and, and lay a good foundation for us to have faith in something. Um, and of course, the, the Bible is a book about who? Jesus. About God, about Jesus, right? Creator God and all the things He's doing. And if if He's not real, then all the things that the Bible says that He did aren't real either. And so the devil has one avenue that he'd like to attack, not one avenue, but one of several uh, avenues that he would like to attack uh, Scripture on. And one of those is um, uh, history. And so... As we, uh, uh, we'll, we'll start there um, uh, reading some stuff uh, on uh, Monday's lesson there in, um, in 2 Samuel. Um, David and Solomon, they represent the golden age in Israel's history, but what if they did not exist? You know, if they didn't exist, um, if David wasn't a real person, can you think of how that would impact your Bible? Boy, thank you greatly. Uh, what impact did David have on, on Scripture? Big impact. Uh, a big impact? <clears throat> such as? <laughs> well, David's mentioned all through the Bible. Yes, he is. He's mentioned in Acts. He's, uh, he's uh, where the lineage of Christ came from. If he didn't exist, would there be that lineage there? No. Okay. Um, but if David was just destroyed, why all the uncomplimentary details of his mistakes that he made? Why would those be recorded? Okay. Typically, um, uh, books of... Uh, Myths and legends and stuff like that, they try to shine the most uh, uh, flattering light, right, on people that they're heroes, if you please. And the hero is always the hero, right? Uh, very rarely is he flawed. Um, look at 2 Samuel 23, and verse 2, I want to go to. 2 Samuel 23. These are David's last words, some of them. But uh, somebody wants to read that when you get it. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. What is David claiming there? That God is with him. That God spoke through him. Spoke through him. Okay, and what evidence do we have that God spoke through David in our Bible? That scripture. What? That scripture. That one that you just read? That we just read? No, but is there, is there a book in the Bible that, that David had something to do with? Psalms. Psalms. Quite a few Psalms. All but just a handful of Psalms he was responsible for. Have you found any comfort there? Or, and, and you were talking about some of the unflattering details of his life. Even some of the Psalms talk about those unflattering details, and yet they used them as their hymn book. 
<laughs> uh, quite fascinating, right? Well, we wouldn't have the story of David and Goliath if there weren't. David and Goliath? <coughs> okay, and uh, so uh, we have the, the, uh, the book of Samuel. You know, he, he were kind of recorded some events in Israel's history, and David was part of that. And if there was no David, then that, what does that make Samuel? Making a liar. Yeah, just a, a made up story. Something. And so we, we, we want to make sure that if we're going to tug at that, that uh, string and unravel that fabric, we know what we're looking at. Um, so first Samuel, while we're there in Samuel's, um, but I want you to just see how, how David, from his own lips, he says, you know, the Spirit of the Lord spoke through me, right? And his words were on my tongue. Hmm. And so there's inspiration. And so the Bible, what do we consider that as? Holy yeah. Scriptures or, or what? The Word of God. Yeah, holy men of God that were moved by the Holy Spirit, right? And they shared with us these things. And um, very, very significant. So 1 Samuel uh, 16, 1 Samuel 16, where David was anointed. Um, there's, there's something there in verse, uh, of course we know the story. Uh, Jesse was told to bring his sons so Samuel could see which one was going to be the next king. And uh, he brought all his sons, and, and Samuel kept saying, "What? Surely this is the guy, you know." And what did what did the Lord say? No. No. And he says, "Do you have any other sons?" And says, "Well, we have little David. He's out in the field, but he's hardly worth considering. He's out there tending sheep." And so when he came in, um, he he was the one. But notice what it says in verse 7. And so if Samuel and David are real, um, we get some uh, fascinating insight into what God thinks. If they're not real people, then we're, it's another made-up thing. Uh, verse 7 there. Um, uh, somebody want to read that one? But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Okay, so in that little, encapsulated in that little story of of David's anointing and this is he was bringing um, uh, the older brothers there and, and Samuel said this has got to be the one and God says I, that's not the one he says human nature is is that you look at the outside but what is God's nature looks inside heart if history in the Bible is not true then that never happened and we could get a different idea about God, right? And so these are things that contribute. So the historic, historicity of, of the Bible and its accuracy, it kind of it kind of lays the foundation for some of these well-known stories. Um, the next chapter over there, David and Goliath, right? Um, we have something something happening. Um, uh, going on there, and of course, David was a big, strong, strapping young man. Is that right? No, yes. He's little. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even have his first beard. That's how young he was. Right. And so, um, as people looked at him, they did not see a warrior, did they? No. And in fact, they said, "You're just here to see a battle. You just, you're just after here for the excitement." And of course, God had different ideas, didn't He? Yep. Um, and then David ended up going out to meet Goliath. Of course, if this is actual history, uh, you know, Goliath was from a place. Um, uh, 
people uh, uh, talk about his height and there's some dispute whether he was seven and a half feet tall or nine and a half feet tall depending on your cubits and, and the span of a hand and all that good stuff and, and what the, the, the original Hebrew talks about but um, if, a, if a 12, 13 year old boy stood up against a seven and a half foot tall man that was a, a, a giant of a, a man and a warrior would that diminish the story at all? No. no, he would be he would be uh, in, an incredible foe, uh, regardless. Um, and so, uh, verse forty-five. Uh, after Goliath challenged David, he says, "You know, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds." Um, and um, uh, David says to the Philistine in verse forty-five. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And so David was a man of faith, and of course our Bible tells us that he was a man after God's own heart. And that meant that he lived a perfect life. He had favor with Okay. Well, David. Uh, yeah, but he he lived a perfect life, right? Yes. No moral downfalls. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody remember the story of Bathsheba? Was that a moral flaw? Very much. Yes. Yes. Well, and what you were talking about, Melinda, the, the if we if we record the faults of our heroes. That adds to the veracity of, of, of the historical content of what's going on. It showed David as, a, as somebody who plotted and planned a murder, who took another man's wife, who tried to cover it up. But it also shows him as somebody who repented. Right? And he was sorry for that sin. And of course, he had to live with the consequences of that. And, and so that adds to the veracity of, 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 of the history of it. Um, when it talks about uh, David, the lesson points out uh, there's, a, there's a couple of gates uh, that have been discovered, uh, one in 2008, one in 2013. Um, they are found. They were found to be the, uh, the oldest Hebrew writing ever discovered. And the second inscription mentions uh, the name Eshbaal, uh, and it's the same name as one of Saul's sons. And, um, and so these are historical people. And they were written at the time uh, that these things were going on. Uh, it goes on to talk about the king of Israel and the king of the house of David. It was another discovery that they made in recent years. And for literally uh, uh, centuries, uh, people were, were saying that you can't believe the Bible because there's nobody, there's no historical evidence for somebody that was a King David. And of course, they found it. And uh, you think they'll find more before the end of time? Oh yeah. More evidences that the Bible's true? They'll they'll read the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, in fact, um, when you go to the Middle East, there, it's it's really difficult to get uh, permission to dig in certain places because they know what you're going to find. That's right. It will validate what Scripture says, and that goes against the narrative. Of, of some of the peoples that, that live there. And so uh, this should all, all, all boost our confidence in Scripture. And so history is, is the one facet of the Bible that helps us to not just understand what, what happened, but it, it, it helps to build our faith, right? It gives us confidence that Scripture is true. And if the history is true, what, what should that help us to understand? Biblical truth. Yeah, the doctrines are, are sound as well, right? And the things that it teaches. 
uh, headed over to uh, Monday's uh, lesson talking about Isaiah, Hezekiah, and Sennacherib. And so there in Isaiah 36 and 37, there's this uh, massive Assyrian um, uh, campaign against Judah. And um, it gives a little story there. Somebody want to give a synopsis of what, what happened there? Isaiah 36 and 37. Nobody? Well, verses 1 through 3 there says, So it was when the king Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes. He, there, there was this there was this army that was going to come against God's people. And so the king was upset. He tore his clothes. He covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And then he sent Eliakim, who was <coughs> over the house, and Shebna the scribe and the elders of the priest. They were covered with sackcloth. They sent him to who? Verse 2. Who did they send him to? In verse chapter 37, verse 2, it says, Eliakim, who was over the household, he sent him to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And so these are little details that, that we see. If Isaiah, <laughs> if the Bible's not history, then maybe Isaiah's not, not true either. Uh, what kind of good things come out of the book of Isaiah? Oh, wow. There's a lot of there's a lot of pronouncements <laughs> of uh, judgment, <laughs> uh, not very popular with the people. But um, what else do we get out of Isaiah? There's lots of promises. A lot of promises. There's also a lot of prophecies about who? Jesus. Jesus. About the Messiah. About the coming of the Messiah. And so, and so here's a, a record that mentions Isaiah the prophet uh, there in Hezekiah's day. And um, uh, I, like, I like how God intervenes and shows things to his prophet and it helps give people uh, <clears throat> confidence even when things look dire. Uh, are we living in some troubling times today? Yes. Is God going to just leave us hanging, do you think? No. Nope. And so we have stories like this one. And, and how does God end up delivering his people? By his right hand. Yeah, he was going to fight the battle <coughs> for them? Yep. Right? Yep. It says the angel of the Lord went out and killed the camp, killed in the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000. Wow. So there was an instance where, you know, people say, well, that didn't really happen. But they have dug up battlefields where they, these things are told to have taken place and they find remnants of weapons and chariots and, and everything else. Uh, and some of them don't belong in that area because they're from a different place. And so over and over again, uh, the history of the Bible is told true. And if we can trust the history of, of things that actually took place that are that are talked about here, a great victory for the Lord, uh, how does that help you or does it help you in your confidence with what's, with what's going on today? Uh, in my sermon, I'm going to mention just a couple of the challenges that we got, but we can talk about them here in Sabbath School too. What are, what are a couple of the challenges that we got going on today in our world? Sabbath keeping. Well, Sabbath keeping that's been largely forgotten. COVID. COVID-19. Why is that such a big deal? The entire world loves it. The whole world is feeling uh, feeling it. And, and I was I was looking online that that all over the world, um, 
there are riots because of COVID. And people are wanting not to be locked down and they and they need, you know, they're either out of work or they can't get what they need and and so they're 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 rioting and so it's just it's just sown a lot of chaos. Um, it brought our economy to its knees. And of course, here recently in the last week or so what's been going on? The riots right. the riots killing the color. It's it's racial division and, and uh, you know, we had a, a police officer that, that uh, killed uh, a man by the name of George Floyd and uh, uh, some folks have taken advantage of that to to sow seeds of chaos and, and just uh, rioting and looting and everything else and it seems like our world is unraveling and I talked to an individual this last week and uh, they are feeling the same kind of anxieties they had during the Vietnam War isn't 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 the virus considered a plague? Uh, it's a pandemic for sure, you know. Um, and uh, right now, there's no cure for it, and there's hope that there will be one. But you know, as I said several weeks ago in one of my sermons, that this is the beginning of birth pangs. And did you notice that it's the one's not even done yet, and we have another one on the heels of it, the unrest. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder in my mind what's going to be the next one, but it says they will they will um, uh, come in more more frequently and with more intensity, and so our world is not going to be the same after after this, is it? No. no. If we indeed if we indeed get past it, and so we have a smattering of folks in church here today. We have some people that are still home. And, and uh, um, you know, I watched. Some, I was watching some of the interaction of the crowds uh, and the writing, uh, and the advantages that people were taking of it. Uh, they were delivering pallets of bricks for people to throw oh, at wow. buildings and at, and at policemen. Uh, you know, there's no excuse for the for what happened to to uh, this. Uh, man in Minneapolis. There's no excuse for that. And two wrongs do not make a right. And, and we all know that. And so it, it's like it, it, it's, there's an escalation. And uh, they say it's born out of frustration and oppression and stuff. Uh, let's, let's be clear. Has there been oppression oh, yeah. in the world? Yes. Has there been oppression in the United States? Yep. And with your cell phone and the computer, it's made a lot worse. It, it just magnifies it, and uh, and so does that mean that there's no good going on? No. But it sure takes a back seat, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And and so when I look at my Bible and I see bad things that happen, and, and the king was worried and he was tearing his clothes, and it's like there's no way we can win this. But then they sent some people to the prophet, right? And then they end up having a, 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 a victory that was brought by the angel of the Lord. And so we can, and of course there was a prediction there about Sennacherib's end. Uh, the prophet told how, how he would die and that's the way he died. And so the Bible is history. Um, sometimes it's history in advance. That's what, that's what prophecy that's what prophecy is. Um, the Bible tells out when. <laughs> yep, and it's gonna, it's just gonna keep, um, keep going. Any, anything else on Monday's lesson that you want to bring out as we are quickly running out of time here? But we'll get to Tuesdays anyway. Uh, Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, and Babylon. There's more history, uh, actual places, actual people. Um, and uh, uh, so in July of 2007, a scholar from the University of Vienna was working on a project in the British Museum and he found a tablet from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And on the tablet, uh, he found the name Nebuchadnezzar, and it's the name of a Babylonian official mentioned over in Jeremiah chapter 39. 
Aren't you glad there's people that look for all these details? Oh yeah. And and they just they weave uh, they, they 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 you know stone by stone they lay that foundation of of you know the, that validation of our faith and it and that you know before 2007 they just said ah they could make up a name of anybody but when they go and they get the actual things from that place at that time and they find that person. What else does that tell you? What does that tell you about the Bible and its trustworthiness? That the Bible is true. Yeah, and so it should it should build up our faith. And so the historicity of, of the Bible is is um, something that we want to make sure that we are paying attention to. Was was Daniel considered a prophet? Yes, yes. Daniel was one of the. He would be considered. I don't know if he'd be, he'd be a major prophet. And the ones after him were what they call minor prophets. Uh, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 5. Uh, we look at some of the early on decisions that Daniel made in his life. Um, how did they affect or, or him in his life? Or how did they impact other people? Uh, what happened in, in Daniel chapter 1? Uh, specifically verse 8. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. The story there was that they were to eat the king's food, and what did Daniel and his friends say? No. Decided to follow God. Yeah. And how did they? What's the words they put it in? They purposed in their heart. And so, um, have you ever purposed in your heart for something? Yes. To be true, to be faithful. I was doing a Bible study yesterday. Uh, preparing a young lady for baptism. Incidentally, we have a baptism next week. So don't miss. <laughs> next week we get a baptism. Uh, it's a young gentleman that uh, I've studied with for several months. And uh, unfortunately, they're going to be moving at the end of the month to Arizona. Everybody's going to Arizona. <laughs> That's but uh, we're going to have a baptism next week, and then uh, in a few weeks we're going to have another baptism, young lady. And uh, there's some other folks that have expressed interest in baptism. So things are moving forward. Amen? Amen. Yeah. But I was having a Bible study um, uh, with her, and uh, it was on the, the Sabbath as I'm clearing her for baptism. And, and I said, is the Sabbath just another day? And she's like, no. That's God's day that He wants to spend with us. And I said, so what does that make you want to do? She says, in, in, in my heart, I want to follow Him. Amen. You know, these are words out of a young, young girl. That in my heart, I want to. And it made me think of Daniel where he purposed in his heart to be faithful, to be true. And, uh, uh, you know, it's one thing when we're told that you can't do this on Sabbath or can't do that or this is what the Sabbath keeping should look like. Uh, how much better is it when people say, I, and one of the things she says, she says, I keep, I keep the Sabbath because I love it. Amen. And that's the whole motivation, right? And so it's not about what I can't do. Some of it's about what I don't have to do. Um, I don't have to do laundry on the Sabbath. I get a whole day off from laundry, from yard yard work. Or whatever you want it to there. <laughs> yeah, just plug in that word and say, I don't have to be doing that. And so God says, I need you to stop too. But then you look at all the stuff that you can do. And so we can meet here on a day and, and uh, do different things. Um, uh, how about Daniel? Is he important to us today as Seventh Adventists? Yes, he is. He should be important to everybody. Yeah. In fact, when we talk about history, Daniel is history in advance. He, he projected from his day, King Nebuchadnezzar's day, all the way till when? The end of time. To when Jesus comes. And so has Jesus come yet? No. 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 And so he's talking about you and me too. I often thought, you know, what did Daniel think 
when he sees Cyrus and Darius take over, well, the Medo-Persian Empire take over Babylon. Because he was still there and, you know, just, you know, what encouragement did he get from seeing that, thinking, okay, I may not know everything about what I've been shown, but I know that this first part I got to see. I've often wondered what he thought, you know, what his thoughts were. Well, and his, his faith had to be built, uh, you know, uh, when, when he was looking at the 70 years being fulfilled, he was wondering, is it really true, or did God change his mind? And so God worked through that with him and said, Daniel, you're conflating two things. You're mixing things up here. <laughs> the 70 years is done. You're free to go. But this other prophecy that I gave you of the 2300 days, that's just beginning. And so if, if the 70 year prophecy, and it was true, and the, and the 70 weeks prophecy, if that was true to Christ's coming, what do you think about the 2300 day prophecy? It's spot on. It should be true as well. So we'll go for a couple more minutes here. Any, anything else on Daniel, some of the stories out of Daniel that are encouraging to you? You know, he had the lion's den. Right? Uh, it talked about real people, um, uh, Darius and Xerxes. And, um, all these are historical people from the places that they're supposed to be from. Uh, and yet, uh, some people say that Daniel was written many, many years afterwards. How do we know that that's not true? Some say it was written a couple hundred years after Daniel, but how do we know that it wasn't written that late. Because he was talking about things that wouldn't happen for 200 years after that. And centuries and millennia after that, and we know that they're coming true. Right? We see it all unfolding. And if you read Daniel chapter 10 and Daniel chapter 11, you see all these things that happened and transpired over over centuries and millennia that we see coming true today and we're down to the very end and we're into um, the throes of Daniel chapter 12 and, and we're late in Revelation as well. How about Jesus? Is he important to the history of the Bible? Is it? Oh yeah. The Bible is the history of Jesus. Yeah. What does Paul say about us as Christians? You know what? If Jesus was a man and he was a good teacher and all these other things and he died on a cross, that's all okay. But if there's something else in history that didn't take place, then everything is in vain. The resurrection. And so, and so we have an empty grave and it's fascinating. There's a a website you can go to, I think it's called Cold Case uh, Christianity or something like that, but a fellow that uh, was trained in the, in the uh, police investigation techniques and whatnot, and he went back and looked at the case for Christ, you know, and there's been several people that have done that, and the more they look, the more evidence there is that Jesus was an actual person. But even more important than that, that he resurrected. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, dozens of places in history accounts of people that believe that he rose from the dead and that they were persecuted because they believed that. And so, and then they talk about how Pontius Pilate, how he, how he put a Jesus to death. He put their king to death, it says. And so there's all these different things in history that play out. And Jesus is one of them. Can you think of what our life would be like if Jesus wasn't a, a historical figure? It'd be a mess. We, we wouldn't be here. There'd be no hope because he's not coming if he's not real. And, and so we're just, I don't want to say wasting our time, but it's like we're not, it's in vain, as Paul said. 
Any um, any uh, comments on on the historic historicity of, of Jesus? And you know, there's there's other historians besides Josephus that talk about uh, Jesus walk on the earth, and um, you know, one of the things that's fascinating to me is that our scriptures, some of them were um, just uh, uh, a couple of, of uh, decades after Jesus walked the earth. And so they were, they were eyewitness accounts and they were from very early on. Uh, many of the things in, in uh, the New Testament were written before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. They said if they wanted to talk about something, they could have talked about that, but they didn't because it hadn't happened yet. And so all the things that they were talking about was prior to that. So you, you know it's within 10, 20, 30 years of, of, of being written and, and the accounts, and they, they have all these different things. They looked up the popularity of names that are in the Bible and, and what regions from the world they come from, when they were popular. You can get on Google and Google your name and see how popular it is. And where and, and when it peaked and when it's when it's gone down, they have done the same thing with Bible names, and they find out that all the people that were mentioned there, it was popular in that area at that time. But 20, 30 years later, not so much. How many people you think got named Judas after? <laughs> not very many. Not very many. No. Why? Because he was a bad guy. Okay. So it was either a myth that people bought into or he was an actual person that people said, eh, not so much. I think I'll name him John or <laughs> you know, Peter or somebody else. So it's fascinating. So, well, your pastor needs to get a drink and uh, uh, whatnot, but uh, we'll come back in in about 11. We'll sing a song and then I'll have some sermon. Uh, time. Uh, take the time. If you need a tithe envelope, pick one up. Uh, there's a, a offering plate in the back if you just want to throw your tithe in there um, for that. You don't have to throw it. You can lay it in. Um, Walk high. And then I'll have a couple of announcements here before <coughs> before we uh, uh, start sermon time. All right. We'll see you in about four or five minutes. Thank you.